Hey there, in this talk we're going to discuss STEMI mimics. So STEMI or ST elevation myocardial infarction is obviously one of those big bad things we worry about out in the field. Uh, and there are a couple of different things that can look just like it. So that's kind of scary for us because we worry about this person with chest pain or other concerning symptoms. And the one good thing we have to base our treatment on is an EKG. And unfortunately there are a couple of things that can kind of mimic uh, this, this STEMI type pattern. So first off, what is a STEMI? Well, by definition, it's new ST elevation, uh, usually in two or more contiguous leads on the EKG. Also with evidence of necrosis. Now in the hospital, we use things like cardiac biomarkers or maybe echo uh, to determine this. Um, out in the field, it's mainly going to be new or presumed new ST elevation with concerning symptoms, uh, most likely chest pain, but also shortness of breath, diaphoresis, nausea, things like that. Now the geography of a STEMI helps us kind of localize and diagnose where we think the lesion might be. You can do a whole talk on this in and of itself, but it's good to review because just knowing the geography and the focal findings can help differentiate a STEMI uh, versus STEMI mimic. Now STEMI mimic is kind of getting annoying to say, so from here on out we'll just call it a STEMIC, much easier. Now we're going to start off with two quick warnings. First off, the presence of a STEMIC does not rule out a STEMI. We can't get too tunnel vision on a presumed benign cause and totally throw out the possibility of something dangerous. And second, if you suspect a STEMI before the ECG, suspect a STEMI after it. ECGs are not perfect. Our interpretation is not perfect. Sometimes the best thing we have to go on is our clinical suspicion. Now here's a list of the STEMICs we're going to cover. It'd be way too easy just to tell you what they are. So for each one, we'll cover an ECG and I'll tell you what it is, and then we'll go through some different findings that might help you catch the diagnosis. It may be good for you to pause the video after I present each case so that you can analyze the ECG before I reveal what the STEMIC is. This first case is a 65-year-old male with known heart history complaining of shortness of breath. This ECG shows some classic findings of a left bundle branch block. In a left bundle branch block, we get a blockage of the left side of the conduction of the heart. Because of that, the normal depolarization that goes from left to right switches to right to left. Because of this, we get ECG findings including a widened QRS, broad notched R wave in 1, V5, and V6, and a dominant S wave in V1. In addition, the ST segment and T wave are opposite the vector of the QRS. So now we have this really funky looking baseline ECG, which could possibly mask signs of a STEMI. So what do we do when this person presents with active chest pain? Well, the original thought was that even if the person was asymptomatic, if they had a new or presumed new left bundle branch block, that equaled an acute myocardial infarction until proven otherwise. The evidence that these guidelines were based on were from the pre-CATH and PCI age where they really didn't have definitive evidence if the people in the studies were actually having myocardial infarctions. And this led to a very high rate of negative catheterizations. Due to this, and in light of recent studies that have used catheterization evidence, in 2013 the AHA changed their guidelines to say that new or presumed new left bundle branch block was no longer a diagnostic criteria for acute myocardial infarction. What it all comes down to really is our clinical suspicion. In the hospital, we have things like biomarkers and echo to confirm diagnosis, but in the field, if you feel like it's acute myocardial infarction, go ahead and treat it like that. Now luckily, we do have some criteria to help us analyze the ECG in light of a left bundle branch block to evaluate for myocardial infarction. This is known as the Scarbosa criteria. It was developed back in the 90s, and what they did was look at people with left bundle branch block both with and without myocardial infarction and try to find different characteristics within the ECG to differentiate between the two groups. From their data, they were able to come up with three different categories. Category A was concordant ST elevation greater than one millimeter with a positive QRS. Concordant meaning that the main axis of the ST elevation goes in the same direction as the main axis of the QRS. Category B was concordant ST depression greater than one millimeter in V1 through V3. And category C was discordant ST elevation greater than 5 millimeters with a negative QRS. Here the categories are shown in a much easier way. Uh, again, category A and B we can see they are concordant to the QRS vector. Category C is discordant to the QRS vector. 
If you look at this ECG, you're able to see two different criteria. First, criteria A in green, and criteria C in blue. Based on this ECG and with the right symptoms, this patient would be considered to be having a myocardial infarction. Now the strength of the Scarborosa criteria is its high specificity, meaning that if it's positive, there's a high likelihood the person's having a STEMI. Its weakness is low sensitivity, meaning that it could actually miss a bunch of cases. The criteria was most specific with the category A and B. Because of this, and based on evidence that's a little beyond the scope of this talk, something called the modified Scarborosa criteria was developed. What this changed was category C. It changed to discordant ST elevation or depression with an ST to S ratio greater than 0.25. Now, if you want more information on this or want to understand a little better, it's worth taking some time to really go through the study and the diagram on the slide. Now, bringing it all together, here's a quick clinical diagram to guide your treatment. First off, any hemodynamic in instability or acute heart failure, these people are treated as a STEMI. Secondly, we look at Scarborosa A or B. If that's negative, we go to that C category of the modified Scarborosa. If all those are negative, we follow these people with serial EKGs and biomarkers. Here's our next ECG. This is a 30-year-old male, healthy, with a recent URI upper respiratory infection. This is kind of your classic patient for pericarditis. Now, some of the ECG signs of pericarditis include widespread concave ST elevation, as well as widespread PR depression. This depression can often be late and is not very specific for pericarditis, but it's something to look for. As we know, since AVR and V1 can act a little funky sometimes, these changes that we see with pericarditis will be opposite or reciprocal in these leads. So we get an ST depression and PR elevation. Now the man on the right here is Amal Matu. He is a great emergency medicine educator who specializes in all things cardiology. His rules for determining STEMI versus pericarditis are first, look for factors that favor myocardial infarction, including reciprocal ST depression, ST elevation in 3 greater than 2, horizontal or convex up ST elevation, and known new Q waves. Once you determine that the person isn't definitely having an MI, then you can look for factors that strongly favor pericarditis, including the widespread concave ST elevation and the PR depression in multiple leads. There are a couple other signs that have less evidence. Uh, this one Almo calls his RT sign or checkmark sign. This favors myocardial infarction. What this is, is an abrupt change from the R wave to the T wave that you can see on the top ECG. On the bottom ECG, you can see a much slower change from the R to the T. The next sign is a spotic sign. This favors pericarditis. What this is is a downsloping of the TP segment. So this and the RT sign, uh, again, don't have great evidence. Uh, but if you're looking for something else to back up your clinical suspicion, it might help. This next ECG is an 18-year-old female, otherwise healthy, who's complaining of dizziness. This morphology is very classic for benign early repolarization, which is also known as J-point elevation. Some classic findings on ECG are widespread concave ST elevation, most prominent in the anterior leads and notching at the J-point, which is usually most prominent at V4. T-waves are usually tall in V2 through V5 and slightly asymmetric. As with the other rhythms, we need to first make sure we don't suspect myocardial infarction. So factors that support benign early, early polarization are no reciprocal ST depressions, except maybe AVR, and ST change is relatively stable over time, and no pathologic Q-waves. It can also sometimes be difficult to differentiate these changes from pericarditis. Well, features that support BER are ST elevation limited to precordial leads, absence of PR depression, prominent T waves, and the fish hook or the J-point notching, especially at lead V4. This ECG is a 65-year-old male with a history of aortic stenosis. The changes here are indicative of LVH with strain pattern. As we know in LVH, the left ventricle becomes large, and the ECG shows evidence of this with left side changes showing increased R amplitude and right side changes showing increased S depth. There are multiple voltage criteria which can be used in the limb leads uh, to 
determine if an ECG is showing evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. There are also evolved such criteria for the precordial leads. I don't think it's very important to put all these to memory, but definitely have them handy. There are also non-voltage criteria, including an increased R-wave peak time and what we call the strain pattern, which is ST segment depression and T-wave inversion in the left side of the leads. This can often be mistaken for ischemic reciprocal changes. Finally, we have everybody's favorite ECG that shows up on every board exam. This is the 20-year-old male presenting with sudden cardiac arrest. The findings in this ECG are classic for Brugada syndrome. Now, Brugada stems from a mutation of the cardiac sodium channel genes. The scary thing about this is it often inflicts very young people, especially males in classically Asian descent. And when it's diagnosed is when these people suddenly collapse or go into a sudden cardiac rhythm at a very young age. Now, Brugada has three different types seen on ECG. Type 1 is the only diagnostic type. So it's the only type that you can actually diagnose Brugada syndrome based on what the ECG shows you. And it's ST elevation greater than 2 millimeters and more than one lead of V1 through V3, followed by a negative T. This is often called the sail sign because the ST segment looks like a sail. Now that's the Brugada morphology on ECG, but to actually diagnose the syndrome, they have to have that in conjunction with documented VF or VTAC, a familial history of sudden cardiac death, inducible ventricular tachycardia, or syncope. Now there are two other types. Brugada type 2, which again is non-diagnostic, is greater than 2 millimeter saddleback ST elevation. And type 3, again not diagnostic, is type 1 or type 2, but with less than 2 millimeters ST elevation. Now, Brigada is one of those things we're always scared of, but rarely see. So the information may not be fresh in your head. I do want to put a plug in for a very useful website, BrigadaDrugs.org, which is funded by a Netherlands nonprofit. And on there, you can find evidence for pro-rhythmic drugs, so drugs that may actually throw them into a bad rhythm, people with Brigada syndrome, and also the emergency treatment if you should come across a patient with this. All right, now we're going to do a quick rapid-fire ECG challenge to wrap things up. Each of the following ECGs is either a STEMI or a STEMIC. Your options for what they are will be on top of the screen. I'll give you a couple seconds to figure each one out. Here's the first ECG. This is actually a true anterior STEMI. We see your ST elevation in V2 through V4 with reciprocal changes in 2, 3, and AVF. Here's ECG number 2. This is an example of pericarditis. We see diffuse ST elevation with PR depression and spotic sign, which is the downsloping TP segment. ECG number three. This is a left bundle branch block. Classic left bundle morphology we talked about. We don't see any of the scarbosa criteria to suggest a STEMI as well. ECG number four. This is benign early repolarization. We see ST elevation in the anterior leads, concave up with no reciprocal ST depression. ECG number five. This is a can't miss. This is an inferior STEMI. We see ST elevation in two, three AVF, the inferior leads, with reciprocal depressions in one and AVL. ECG number six. This is LVH with strain. We see a large S wave in V2, a large R wave in V5, which meet our voltage criteria, and a strain pattern with depressions in V5, V6. ECG number seven. This is a fun one. This is a posterior STEMI. We see flat T wave depressions in the anterior leads, which often lead people to think it's just ischemia. But if you actually invert the ECG, or obtain a posterior ECG, you'll see that the person's actually having a posterior STEMI. When you invert the ECG, what you see is those flattened depressions turn into ST elevation. ECG number eight. Now this is a paste rhythm. We didn't talk about this, but it's very similar to left bundle branch block. 
but with pacer spikes before the QRS. No Scarbrosa criteria is met. Scarbrosa criteria can be used with paced ECGs, but without the accuracy of left bundle branch block. And finally, ECG number 9. This is the big bad left bundle branch block with underlying STEMI. We see the classic left bundle branch block pattern. What we also see is concordant ST elevation greater than 1 mm in V5-V6 and possible excessive discordant ST elevation in V3. It's hard to tell because the S-weight goes off the paper, but we meet Scarbrosa criteria A, which is good enough. Well, I appreciate you watching. I hope this talk gave you a little insight into some of the STEMICs out there. And I hope it will help you shed some light on some pretty scary ECGs in the future. Always remember, use your clinical suspicion. If you suspect a STEMI, treat it like a STEMI. From there, use different bits and pieces of evidence and different little clues within the ECG to help tailor your treatment.